Interesting family dynamic. I know that a lot of your inspiration is from your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Is it? Can I say Bert? Am I allowed can to say Bert? You can call him Bert. Bert Binkendor. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Bert. Well, he was. Uh, he died three years ago. He's uh, an inspiration. He was a visionary. Uh, he cared about the community. Cared about culture. Cared about um, high standards. Um, taught me a lot about design and how to bring design thinking and influence of design into the work I do. Um, was an educator, and so both he and my mother shaped me in so many ways. Yeah, you um, when you think about that, and um, you know, I know you have a, the things that you do, the uh, the way that you approach community, the stuff that um, the projects that you've been involved in over the history of it. So you got your your upbringing, where your family brought you up. Yep. Um, but what about the experiences outside of that, like uh, well, the marketing experience and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of in a, I, I credit my parents more than anybody else with defining who I am. I've got a mechanical engineering degree, uh, which I feel in many ways from thinking um, in a very organized and structured way um, around innovation and new product development, which could be a conceptual product or a physical product. I mean, that certainly informs who I am. And then the seven years I spent as a partner in an advertising and marketing agency really informed how we go out into the community with um, civic brands and new ideas and try and get people to engage in things that inspire them to co-create. You think that being an engineer or at least having an engineering degree gives you any weight or uh, um, insight to this engineering community that's in Dayton? A little bit. I mean it certainly helped give me some credibility when we did the projects with the Air Force Research Lab because I did have an engineering background but I also worked with a lot of artists so I understood both sides of the, of the equation. And I think that that helped um, make that project possible. How did you get first introduced to that? Through the, was that the Wright Brothers Institute? Yeah, I met Joe Shabika because of the Ten Living City Symposium. And I came here to do Blue Sky, but then um, you know we did the Ten Living City Symposium on the one year anniversary of the Forbes Ten Fastest Dying Cities list. And that really kind of put me um, out on the radar quite a bit, more so than Blue Sky did. Eventually, I met Joe Shabika, who was the head of the Air Force Research Lab, and he and I just connected. He decided he wanted to do something different to try and shake up what he thought was really a lack of innovation that was happening, um, and trying to figure out if there's some different ways we can think about problem solving. And so I came up with the idea of bringing together artists and engineers, and what would happen if you put them in a room together, and the engineers were able to tap into the tools and mental models that artists use to solve problems. So the ability to speak multiple languages, as it were, not foreign languages, but to talk to different constituent groups and be very um, fluent in those um, in, the, in their needs, I think is part of what's helpful in doing the things that we do. Hmm. Tell me more about Blue Sky. <laughs> what inspired you to, to put that project together? Um, so I was living in uh, McHenry County, Illinois. That's the smallest of the collar counties of Chicago. There was definitely a lack of um, arts programming for youth there. Um, I had heard about a program called Gallery 37 that Maggie Daly was very involved in in the city of Chicago, which was more of a teaching type program, but we ended up deciding how we maybe do something along those same lines, and so we advertised to try and find an executive director. And I actually ended up meeting this incredible um, woman, Makita Ahuja, who's now an internationally renowned artist, um, and we actually sent her to Rockford for one summer in 2004 to look at their version of Gallery 37. Mm -hmm. And then Makita came back and really turned everything on its head uh, and turned it into kind of a non-hierarchical collaborative project rather than a more of a teaching where there's an artist and students. And <laughs> that was really um, a game changer. The artists who participated uh, talked about it being transformational to their careers because the community the um, working together, the support of nature of it was very different than what most residencies looked like. And then for the high school students, it just opened them up to a whole different way of thinking about the world and of doing art, not as a project, but really as a, an opportunity to communicate 
and, and in, in a environment with other students, but also with professional artists. Hmm. So, I mean, from an arts background <coughs> to the community work, how did that, how did that leave from? Well, I've always been passionate about the community work. That's really how we started with our Sister Neighborhoods project. Um, that was the very first initiative in 1992, and it came out of two tragic shootings, one in 1988 in Winnetka, which is a wealthy suburb of Chicago, and one in October of 92 um, in Cabrini Green, which is a fairly notorious public housing community. And I guess I like to pride myself on um, saying I like to turn lemons into lemonade, and so I had an epiphany, I guess, that what good could come out of these two tragic shootings in which six-year-old boys were both killed. And so I came up with the idea for Sister Neighborhoods. The name came from Sister Cities, which is uh, like uh, an international program, but this would be at the local level. And a lot of people were somewhat flummoxed, I would have to say, because they would ask me, but are people in Cabrini Green, poor urban public housing community, primarily African-American, and Winneka, rich white suburban, what, what people in those communities have in common? And um, you know, my, my response was always the same. Um, other than their shared humanity, probably not much. And I met these two absolutely extraordinary women. And out of that first conversation between these two women, we started the only community-run newspaper in Chicago public housing called Voices of Cabrini, which published for four years. And that really set me on a course that I'm on today, that experience of doing collaborative civic innovation um, with people from very different backgrounds. Um, I guess I like to say I can see dots that most people don't see and connect them in ways most people can't imagine. And so what this has really evolved into now is really a community R&D department. If you think about this, companies invest in R&D all the time, but the community needs a place where new ideas can, can flourish, where people can come with their ideas and, and, and be met with, with open arms to help them get their passions out into the, into the community. And so that's really what the collaboratory is today, is a, a physical place, but more than a physical place, it's really an ideal, a mindset. You know, wherever you and I are, that's where the collaboratory is. Whoever we're collaborating with, that's what the collaboratory is doing. And so we are not um, beholden to it. We're not in a single swim lane of a subject matter. It's, it's really about building a better Dayton, unleashing Dayton's potential. And people need to feel that there's a trusting, accepting place where they can come share their stories and know that they will be not judged, but helped in, in moving their gifts and talents to action. So it was the collaboratory in Cabrini? No, originally um, the organization was founded as Involvement Advocacy. Involvement Advocacy. Yes, and so that, that name comes from a Chinese proverb, tell me I'll forget, show me I'll remember, involve me I'll understand. And the idea uh, at its founding was to give residents the tools and resources they need to address systemic changes in their own in their own communities. I, I will have to admit that involvement advocacy is not the most wonderful brand name and so over time we either used the program brand names and then a couple years after I came to Dayton we embraced the collaboratory and so it's still the same legal entity from 1992 um, but we operate under, under the collaboratory now. Well so when you think about that concept of the collaboratory and uh, well I mean how'd you come up with the name? Um, I thought I, I thought I invented it, um, but collaboration and laboratory, you know, you know like an R&D department, incubator, accelerator, place to try new ideas, innovation, imagination, all of those things. And then I, I did a Google search and found out that the name already existed. But I, I was too, uh, I was too inspired by that. Um, but I think I think people get it um, because again, at the end of the day, this is all about mutuality. This is all about a place where people can come and be curious, where they can share their ideas where they can find energy. You know, so yes, we are an information resource, not unlike the library. Um, we're an inspiration resource, not unlike, for some people, a house of worship. They, they come in and, and are able to kind of celebrate their gifts and be inspired and motivated and energized to go out in the community and, and do good work. So we, we represent lots of different elements in the community, but we're really just focused on how do we develop new enterprises and initiatives in the community that are gonna lift um, lift people up. And that could be a whole range of things. Probably our biggest success story is the Dayton Sewing Collaborative. And that was an idea I probably had going back to 2012. And it took some serendipity in August 2014. I happened to meet two women, both named Pam. Uh, one happened to be African-American, one happened to be white, both happened to be passionate about sewing. 
And so I, I, I met them independently, but I got them together for a conversation. And basically at that moment, the Dayton Sewing Collaborative was born. The following spring, I happened to meet Brenda Rex by chance. She got excited, and uh, before you know it, we had a real project. We opened our doors in um, June of 2016, and then we spun it out as, as an independent nonprofit organization. That is really an example of what we're here to do, is to be a place where things can get started, whether it's our idea, whether it's somebody else's idea, and then it can go off into the community and really have an impact. Today, they've partnered with Goodwill Easter Seals. they got great space. Um, they're just doing lots of good work creating job opportunities for, for folks. Um, and, 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 and so that's the kind of legacy we look to live, leave in the community. What's the job uh, <coughs> and work opportunities that come out of that? Where, where? So Dayton actually has uh, three or four major manufacturers that, re that require sewists, primarily immigrant populations. And so we were fortunate to make um, connections with all of those companies. And so they really rely on the sewing collaborative. In fact, when Lion Apparel announced they were opening a factory here, which they are from here, but don't have a factory here, they stated that the presence of the Sewing Collaborative as a training facility was the reason they ultimately made their decision to come to date. So that shows that we are having an impact in a significant ways, even though it's not always easy to measure. Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm talking about measurement, impact, community. It seems like a lot of what happens here is about um, connecting folks from different places, whether that be physically different places, whether that be socially different. Just um, what what do you think is what do you think is the challenge of that? And then tell me what the reward is. Right. Well, I mean, the challenge is just in large part is having a, a, a wide enough network, diverse network, where you can basically reach into any community, um, not just me, but lots of people who hang out here are, are connected to all different parts of Dayton. And so it's like, but it, it is, we're, we are marketing something. So if we have a conversation about something, you know, if you're interested in restorative justice, you're going to show up for that. If you're not interested in restorative justice, but you're interested in sewing, you're going to come to that. Um, but really knowing a lot of people, being able to empathize with, with anybody where they are, we are so non-judgmental of folks. I think for a lot of people who usually don't feel they're being heard when they come here, they they experience something very transformational. They realize that people are willing to listen to their stories and engage them and support them. We met a young lady through um, who went through a program with the Community Action Partnership um, who is a crafter. And so I, I pulled together a small group, including one of the founders of um, the Sewing Collaborative. We, she lives over in DeSoto Bass. We went over to her place. We helped her get something started. I, we got somebody to, um, to donate an uh, inexpensive sewing machine to her because she was um, uh, sewing everything by hand. And so, I mean, there's a, a situation where we were able to provide some, some moral support, some encouragement, and some professional advice on how she could improve her um, you know, abilities in her business. And so, Sometimes they seem like one-offs, but you know we got 150,000 people in the metropolitan statistical area, and the way you fix it is one, one person at a time. If everybody here were meeting their full potential, our community would be thriving. It would be on fire. There'd be so much energy we couldn't stop it. And so that's the challenge that we have to figure out: is how do we build systems and models that are, is going to allow everybody to, to ultimately unre un unleash their potential. And once she's got the craft, she's able to pay you, right? That's right. No. <laughs> no. So there's no charge for the community to walk through the doors, right? right? That, that's correct. So we, we operate kind of like the library does. Um, and again, I think you know, over time, I mean, libraries started out, uh, Andrew Carney built a lot of libraries back in the late 1800s and early 20th century. But we, we embrace the library as a resource that we want people to take advantage of whether it's reading a book or going on a computer or <coughs> seeing a special program. And so that's the reason we don't charge people because we want to encourage people to come here because we know their intention is to better the community, not personally profit from what they're trying to do. And so, oh, well, Judith, I have to pay a fee to the collaboratory, maybe, well, maybe I'm not going to go. And maybe their idea doesn't get off the ground. So we pretty much have an open door policy because we think that the community deserves to have a place that is going to be receptive to all comers. 
not just people who have the means to pay for this kind of help. The best ideas are those that come from the community. On that note, um, a lot of what goes on at the collaboratory, or in, at, well, just like people don't know that involvement advocacy is the is the uh, organization that created the collaboratory. Um, and in the same vein, people don't necessarily associate the value that comes out of the collaboratory with things that go in the community. Several things go in the community, community engagement. Um, like I, I met you via community engagement. Drum Dayton was um, this great drumming festival that I actually met your wife, Dot. Yep out on the courthouse square, there's drummers, I had my kids out there. Um, uh, just one of these great community engagement things that people take for granted, I think. Yeah. Um, but they don't necessarily know that behind it is the collaboratory right. involvement advocacy and the work that's being done here. And I think that's, I mean, that's always been a challenge when we were in Illinois and, you know, the, and Blue Sky was the dominant name and what we should call everything Blue Sky. But that also can be confusing. It's like if Procter & Gamble called everything Crest, would Crest be toothpaste or laundry detergent? Um, and so we do get into some, you know, so, some issues there. But I think what is more important that you know can people identify with us is the connections that come out of every one of these community initiatives. Even some of them are just one off. I mean, yeah, you and I met at um, at, at, at Drum Dayton. We met Montre at Drum Dayton, who's become a huge collaborator with us from his drum corps. He's opened up all three years of, of Porch Fest. So that's a relationship that came out of that. Um, the people I met through the 10 living cities, like Michael Gaynor from Buffalo and whatnot. I mean, it's just created so many relationships. Those people stay, you know, feeding back into the network. We continue to support them in, in new initiatives. And so that ultimately is the value, is the social capital we're creating for people who come through the door by helping them enhance their, their networks and their ability to be successful out in the community. Um, we're very generous in opening doors for other folks and trying to build those um, relationships. At the end of the day, everything in life happens because of people and relationships. Even the ability to access funding happens because of uh, people and relationships. And I think we often um, forget that. I think the other thing that's important about the collaboratory is very, uh, very citizen-centric. It's very human-centered. Um, we don't did not include people, we encourage all people to come through the door, but we um, don't want people coming in as institutional representatives when they come into the collaboratory. Everybody's a citizen here, but we try and avoid people putting their institutional agenda ahead of what is best for the community. And I think that allows there to be a lack of hierarchy, whether it's a university president or a leader of the Air Force Research Lab or a, a, a CEO of a company or a lot of the ex-offenders that we're working with through our X-Factor um, project, which is again, very unusual project that uh, allows uh, formerly incarcerated people to join a community service corps. The idea is, can we change how people see the formerly incarcerated? And so the idea of a group of volunteers who are all ex-offenders out in the community, whether it's neighborhood cleanup or Habitat for Humanity or after the tornadoes or working with Mission to Mary Farm, that's like the last group you'd expect. I, I a Boy Scout troop comes out, the church group, maybe it's a corporate, you know, a, a corporate volunteer day. But what? A group of formerly incarcerated people are, are giving back to the community? That is, sends a powerful message to, to the community and at the same time it allows them to become more more whole in the community as they see that their value and their appreciation is real and they can hopefully start to shed that label which can, can be very deep and debilitating and so people may have seen the work I know that X Factor was doing work uh, in the t tornado relief yep. um, when, when the community was affected by tornadoes and I think that that again goes to a lot of things that happen in this community that people are not aware that are collaboratory in their start Yep. And so X Factor is a returning citizens initiative that's, uh, that has um, helped give back to the community. Um, you have great long-standing community engagements with Porch Fest, Dayton yep. Porch Fest. That is a collaboratory um, initiative. Um, and then and these are things that are, you know, the opportunity to bring in these ideas and these community engagement platforms from all over, uh, like the FNOSH. Right. No. So that, that's a really exciting program. Again, <coughs> through some serendipity, I met a gentleman at a conference um, in 2014. He lives in Greensboro. 
and we stayed connected on social media and all of a sudden I realized he had launched an initiative called Ethnage in Greensboro and the, the, the basic premise was to have a monthly community dinner at a different immigrant owned restaurant and it served family style so you probably sit at tables of six or eight people you get some amazing food you get a story from the owner of the restaurant how they got to America how they got to Dayton what attracted them to the restaurant industry some things about their culture and then you got to meet new people so we're the only we're the only the second city in the country after Greensboro to have um, to have Ethnage here <laughs> again that has been a powerful experience because people have made new connections we've supported local businesses and we've promoted the diversity of the ethnic restaurants that we have in the community and again the ideas don't have to be ours we're happy to take them you know, you mentioned Porch Fest that was started in Ithaca in 2007. My hometown of Cleveland was the second Porch Fest. We launched ours in 2017. We're about the 93rd Porch Fest now. There's probably 200, but again, there's a way for us to bring community together to celebrate the diversity of our creative um, musical scene here. It's a free one-day festival in St. Anne's Hill, and after just three years, it has become a, 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 probably the largest free music festival in the city of Dayton and a can't miss event for folks. The bands want to come back, we don't pay them. They seem to do pretty well with their tip jars, but they just love the vibe and the atmosphere and being out in the, in the community and the community has responded. And so the common thread around all these things, you say, oh, you got, a, you got an X Factor, you got an X Offenders, you got an ethnic dining, you, you know, you, you've got music, this is all over the place, but no, it's all about unleashing Dayton's potential and connecting people to each other. That is the common thread because without that mutuality, we cannot have community here. <laughs> Thinking about how do you how do you how do you how do how do you how do you convince someone or how do you show someone um, where that potential is? You know, like I know we've had discussions about where the where what are the what are the what are the what are the potential what what is it that we're unleashing you know that there's the physical potential of a place, the the assets that a community has, uh, and then the, the people themselves. Right, and I think a lot of it has to do with completely changing the kind of conversations we're having because people really know at the end of the day what it is that they they want or they have the ability to articulate it. I mean I'm going to go back to um, the whole sister neighborhood situation where I met these two women, it took me a while, but you know, one day I, I picked Henry Rand up, um, stood under her fifth story window or a 12 story high rise in Cabrini Green. I would call up to her. She came down, we drove up to Winnetka. I was like a fly on the wall of this conference room in Winnetka with these two women and a video camera telling their stories. And it was powerful as all get out here. I mean, here are two women who, again, seemingly have nothing in common, but who were caring mothers, sisters, daughters, um, caring community members. And we're about 45 minutes into the conversation and Cynthia um, from Winnetka starts talking about how she and some women friends from Winnetka were feeling misunderstood. And you're thinking to yourself, how could women from Winnetka be misunderstood? I mean, you got lots of money and you're, you're all you know, professionals and you've got to be living a good life. And uh, you know, what's, what's up with that? And so she went on to say, well, you know, most people think we're CEO wives and junior leaguers and we spend the day shopping and playing tennis. And myself and two other women decided we needed to tell a different side of life in Winnetka because there's more to see here. Um, and that was really important to us. And at that moment, Henrietta blurted out, we need a community newspaper at Cabrini Green. We're not all welfare queens, drug addicts, and gangbangers. And basically at that moment, that's how Voice of Cabrini got started. Because in the moment of, the, of that conversation, of the way the conversation was structured, Henrietta had an aha moment about what her community needed. And you know, here I came along with the three women from NECA and we're out two days later recruiting other residents and in April of 93, you know, the first issue came out. But our conversations here are so different than happen really anywhere else because we don't have an agenda. We're really here to create those moments um, that allow people to talk about what it is that they want to unleash for their own, for their own community. Um, it's hard to explain that to people um, you know, I've obviously been in thousands of conversations, but I hear it over and over again that they're just so different because people leave feeling empowered and motivated and inspired, and they know that somebody just didn't hand them, here's three things to do, and, and, and push them out the door. But we're going to stand alongside you um, and figure out how we can help you get whatever you started that you're trying to get started. 
when people are getting started in neighborhoods or uh, initiatives, I want to kind of uh, dig into the research and development part, which is, I know sometimes people come in with an idea. Yep. Uh, sometimes the idea starts here. Uh, and then sometimes the ideas are a product of those improbable parents of people. Yep. Um, and so when we look at that in that lens, what's what do you what, what do you see? What's what's up next? You know, right. So we've got two big initiatives that are coming up next. They were we're unru unveiling and very excited about. Um, one is called the the Journalism Lab, and that is being done in partnership with. Um, Stephen Starr and, and some other journalists, but Stephen was really the driver um, behind this. He has uh, been in the United States in Dayton for two years. He's an Irish national, married to a Syrian. Um, he was living in the Middle East, um, and, but he's an international freelance journalist. And so he found us online probably in the first couple of weeks he was here. And uh, But he kept telling us he wanted to do a journalism workshop, he wanted to do a journalism workshop. And so um, in September this year, we, we put together a journalism workshop. We had about 35 people participate over a series of four workshops. A number of other journalists contributed to the, to the content. By the end of the first of the four workshops, um, Stephen's gears were already turned and it's like, I want to set up almost like a local news bureau so that we can actually develop the, the, the storytellers and the stories um, from Dayton and beyond. For those folks who are looking to extend their journalism skills, maybe either want to get into journalism uh, as a career or you know, look at opportunities for freelancing. And, and so we now have the first cohort group of the Journalism Lab of 16 individuals from throughout the four county area. And they're meeting eight times over through the middle of March. And the goal is for each one to develop a pitch for a local, regional, national, or international publication. But the idea of us being able to do a better job telling our own stories here at home and beyond Dayton, I think is, is really powerful. And so that's where something started with, I want to do some workshops to now we, we've actually got this, this, this cohort group that are that, 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 that really is self-supporting each other. So you know, people are saying, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. Somebody may give them an idea. Some of the folks look like they want to collaborate on stories, but that's often how things happen. But we're here to provide the platform for people like Steven to see their, um, their, their dreams become reality without having to set up your own nonprofit organization to go through all that rig rigmarole, rigor rigmarole. Um, but to be able to have to have that, that that space and the time and the support to do some of the back office and make sure the, the calendar dates are set and all that sort of stuff and the Zoom meetings are set up. Um, so Dayton has a an interesting narrative. You kind of talked about it. Um, community wanted to tell its own stories. Um, and so things, but it seems to be that there is a, a general story that that uh, that Dayton, like a lot of cities, um, similar sized uh, industrial cities in the Midwest and in the nation, face, which is uh, consistent issues around poverty, around equity, around um, really true community. So, so I guess my question in in this one is. Um, yeah, you you've been asked several times to kind of address that narrative. You talked about the Ten Living Cities uh, response to that the, the Forbes article, um, and then even recently the uh, the ProPublica frontline piece that uh, was left behind America. Um, and I know that that is that has led us to where we are now with one of the major initiatives. You tell me a little bit of the background about how you got involved in that. Yeah, I mean, that was a good example of the ProPublica frontline piece that ran in September of 2018. And I actually was reached out to by a couple of senior leaders at the Daily News who wanted to pick my brain because I had organized the 10 Living Cities Symposium. I mean, this was ten, basically 10 years apart. 2008, you got the Forbes list. <clears throat> 2018, you get the, the frontline piece. To, you know, to kind of pick my brain is, you know, what, how, how should we think about responding? because there was a lot of pushback from people in the, in the, in the city. Um, but as we started thinking about the issues that it, it, it brought up, and again, it was called Left Behind America, not Left Behind Dayton, but it really showed Dayton as a manifest example of what has happened to many great American cities and the people who live there as a result of our current socioeconomic model. That is, they've been left behind, for, or in many cases, even just left out. And so to use that as a, as a launching point 
to uh, an initiative that we really started working on in September of two, uh, February of 2019 um, called Reimagining America Dayton, Ohio. And it's really about how do we think differently? How do we think about systems change? How do we, as Buckminster Fuller says, rather than fighting the old system, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete? How can we address the issues of economic inadequacies and inequities and injustice um, of, of the income gap, the lack of access to health care. And, you know, we're working in, in four counties, um, but, you know, Prep County has a lot of the same issues, access to health care, high-speed internet, quality jobs, quality education, that the east side and the west side of Dayton both struggle with. And so we might see these worlds as very disparate. Those folks who are marginalized, who are from low-status communities, are, um, are, are really struggling across the board. And so this is not going to change by nibbling around the edges. This is going to be changed by confronting the models that have created it, it created the situation that we're in. And I think why this aligns so much with the work that we're trying to do is there's you, you can look at theories of science that say systems with the most available energy will be the ones that prevail. And if that's the case, then it gets right back to our notion of unleashing potential. If we can unleash all the potential in Dayton, then we will have a system with the most available energy and we're gonna thrive. But if you don't change the conditions on the ground for too many people, if you don't address those folks who are working two jobs and barely keeping their head above water, then we're never gonna get where the community wants to get. We're gonna to continue to get the haves and the half-nots. I think what is really interesting about this project is that it starts with the idea of um, rethinking how we define and measure success. I think that's fundamentally what is so important here because ultimately what you measure is what, how you build your model. And so we have embraced the Gallup Wellbeing Index um, from the Gallup uh, Polling and Research Organization as how we want to change the definition of success moving from what are primarily economic indicators um, average household income, employment rate, unemployment rate, poverty rates, jobs created, um, jobs retained, things like, like that. They're mostly in the economy space to really focus in on, on well-being. And so uh, the use of the Gallup uh, survey is really serves two purposes. One, it creates a baseline down to um, the granular level of census tracts. So we can look at four counties and we can look at the difference in well-being across individual census tracts so we can pinpoint where the issues are. And, and then that is a repeatable survey that we can do over time to see how our efforts are improving. But the other piece is really the intangible piece. The fact that if we can start talking about well-being as the driver, some countries are talking about their happiness index. We need to change the conversation around making well-being what matters to people in this community, particularly leaders and decision makers. Uh, sense of purpose, physical well-being, financial well-being, sense of community and social well-being, those five domains are what make up the well-being index. And so that is a very different um, set of metrics than what we typically talk about in, in economic terms. It's just like the, we can talk about a high stock market, but that's not the economy. You know, and so what are we doing and how do we make this a citizen-driven effort? Um, not an institutionally driven effort, but a citizen uh, driven effort to, to really demand from our leaders this is the kind of community we want to have. This is what we want to be able to access. We want to have community owned health care. We want to have a reimagined Department of Public Safety rather than a Department of Police. Um, we want to have restorative justice. We want to have equity in education so the kids in Oakwood and Beaver Creek and Centerville are getting a, such a far better education than kids in Dayton are getting. Ultimately, that is foundational to what the future of our community is going to look like.